Good morning to you. Uh, this is our 12th video. CFW Walther's proper distinction between law and gospel. Um, I'm going to have an online version in the description as usual. And this is our 8th lecture from Walther. Our 8th evening lecture dated November 14th, 1884. If the Holy Scriptures were really so obscure a book that the meaning of all those passages which form the basis of articles of the Christian creed could not be definitely ascertained, and if, as a result of this, we should have to acknowledge that without some other authority it would be impossible to decide which of the two or several interpretations of, interpretations of Scripture passages is the only correct one, if these conditions, I say, were true, the scriptures could not be the word of God. How could a book that leaves us groping in darkness and uncertainty regarding its essential content serve as a revelation? The old Jewish Bible of scholars of the Middle Ages in particular declared the meaning of scripture was indeed plain, but that there was a secret meaning of scripture that is, a, that is of high importance and the secret uh, Meaning could not only be explored without the aid of the Kabbalah. For instance, they pointed out that in the first as well as in the last verse of the Hebrew text, the letter Elf occurs six times. Now, an ordinary person, they say, cannot know why this is so, but the Kabbalah gives the explanation that the world is to last 6,000 years. This claim, of course, is quite absurd. Absurd. However, even with the Christian Church in the papacy, the teaching is current that the passage in them, at any rate, very many important teachings of the Christian religion, it is asserted cannot be substantiated from Scripture. To this end, the traditions of the Church are said to be absolutely necessary. This claim of the papists is evident of their blindness. Blindness. To them applies what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 3, If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Luther is right when he says in his ex exposition of Psalm chapter 37, There is not a plainer book on earth than the Holy Scriptures. It is a, in comparison with all other books what the sun is compared with all other luminaries. The papers are giving us their twaddle about the scriptures for the sole purpose of leading us away from the scriptures and raising up themselves as masters over us in order to force us to believe their preaching of dreams. It is an, it is an abomination, a, disgrace, a disgraceful defamation of holy writ and the entire Christian church to say that the holy scriptures are obscure, that they are not clear enough to be understood by everybody, and to enable everybody to teach and prove what he believes, end quote. In his appeal to the counselors of all cities of Germany in behalf of the establishment and maintenance of Christian schools, Luther says, quote, The sophists have claimed that the scriptures are obscure, meaning that it, that it is the very nature of the word of God to be obscure and to speak in strange fashion. But they do not see that the whole trouble is caused by the languages. If we understand the languages, there would not be anything that has ever been sp spoken easier to understand than the Word of God. Of course, a Turk will talk obscure things to me because I am not Turkish, but a Turkish child seven years old understands him readily. Luther is entirely right. The Holy Scriptures are not only as per, per, perspu, yeah, perspu, perspuigus, no, uh, can't even pronounce that correctly. Yeah, pers, pers, uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it this hour. As the plainest writing of men, the Holy Scriptures are not only a per, Precacious as the plainest writings of men, but they are much clearer because they have been set down by the Holy, Holy Spirit, the creator of the languages. 
It is therefore absolutely impossible to prove an error or even a contradiction in Scripture if you stick to its words. It is, it is the truth, then. What we express in our beautiful communion hymn, Lord Jesus, Thou art truly good, when we sing, Firm as a rock, thy word still stands, unshaken by the enemy's hands, though they be ever so cunning. However, while the historical grammatical meaning of Scripture can readily be opened up by anyone who, who uh, understands its language, it is impossible without the Holy Spirit for anyone to understand the Holy Scriptures unto his salvation, no matter how great a linguistic, how famous a philologist, um, uh, uh, I'm half asleep. How keen a logician he may be. The Apostle Paul declares in 1 Corinthians 2, 14, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discer discer discerned. Again, the same Apostle says in 1 Corinthians 1, 23, We preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks, foolishness. Now the primary requisite for a solitary knowledge of the Holy Scriptures is the correct understanding of the distinction between law and the gospel. The Bible is full of light to everyone who has this knowledge. Wherever this knowledge is lacking, all Scripture remains a book sealed with seven seals. We now proceed. Thesis 4. The true knowledge of the distinction of between the law and the gospel is not only a glorious light, according to the correct understanding of the entire Holy Scriptures, but without this knowledge, Scripture is in, in, and remains a sealed book. Turning the leaves of the Holy Scriptures while still ignorant of the distinction between the law and the gospel, a person receives the impression that a greater number of contradictions are contained in scriptures. In fact, the entire scripture seems to be made up of contradictions, worse than the Koran of the Turks. Now the scriptures pronounce one blessed, one blessed, now they condemn him. With the rich young ruler, with the rich youth, asked the Lord, what good things shall I do that I might have eternal life. The Lord replied, If thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. When the jailer at Philippi addressed the identical question to Paul, this is important, in Silas he received this answer, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. On the one hand, we read in Habakkuk 2, 4, The just shall live by his faith. On the other hand, we note in John, in his first epistle, chapter 3, verse 7, he says, He that doeth righteousness is righteous. Over and against this, the Holy Apostle declares, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. On the other hand, we note that Scripture declares God has no pleasure in sinners. On the other hand, we find that it states, Whoever so shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. In one place, Paul cries, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. In Psalm 5, 4, we read, Thou art not a God that has pleasure in wickedness, neither shall do evil dwell with thee. In another place, we hear Peter saying, Hope to the end for grace that is to be brought unto you. On the one hand, we are told that all the world is under the wrath of God. On the other, we, we read, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Another remarkable passage is 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, where the, apostle, where the apostles first make this statement. It should be apostle, typo. Neither fornications nor fornicators, nor idolaters, nor idolaters, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, covenants, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And then he adds, And such were some of you, but you've been washed. You, you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. May not a person 
Mo, uh, sorry, must not a person who knows nothing of the distinction between law and gospel be swallowed up in utter darkness? When reading all this, must not an indignant, 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 indignant cry out, "What? That is to be God's word—a book full of contradictions." For the situation is not this that the Old Testament reveals a wrathful, the New Testament a gracious God, or that the Old Testament teaches salvation by a person's own works. In the New Testament by faith. No, we find both teachings in the, in the Old as well as in the New Testament. But the moment we learn to know the distinction between law and the gospel, it is if the sun rising upon the scriptures, and we behold all the contents of scriptures in the most beautiful harmony, we see that the law was not revealed to us to put that notion into our heads that we cannot become righteous by it, but to teach us that we are utterly unable to fulfill the law. When we have learned this, we shall know what a sweet message, what a glorious doctrine the gospel is, and shall receive it with exuberant joy. The history of the church, too, illustrates the importance of understanding this distinction. Corruption entered the church when law and gospel began to be confounded. A perusal of the writings of the church fathers soon reveals the cause of the church's misery in those early days. People did not know how to distinguish properly between the law and gospel. Up to the 6th century we still find glorious testimonies exhibiting the distinction, but from that time on we notice that this light is grown dim and that the distinction is gradually forgetting. An inst instance illustrating this fact is the monast monastic life which is seen to rise over to rise ever greater distinction. The reply of the Lord to the rich young man was to was understood as showing what is necessary and this is important what is necessary for a person's salvation. The preachers in those days proclaimed the law to the people to whom they should have preached the gospel. Follow the course of history to know that when the papacy had become a dominant, had become dominant, we find the knowledge of this distinction become utterly extinct. A truly abysmal darkness settled upon the church, and sheer paganism and idolatry gained their way into it. Let me get a drink of water here. Remember the agonies of our dear Luther. Considering the darkness which reigned in his day, we must say that compared with others, he had acquired a great knowledge at the beginning of his career, but he did not, did not know how to distinguish law from the gospel. Oh, the toil and torments he had to undergo. His self-castigation and fasting brought him to the point of death. The most crushing and most of Pauling's statement in his estimation at that time was this, that the righteousness which is valid in the sight of God is revealed in the gospel. Alas, he mused, what a woeful state of affairs. First we, approach, first we are approached by the law which demands of us that we fulfill it, and now in addition we are, we are to be made righteous by obeying the gospel. Luther confesses that there were times in his life when he ha has harassed with blas when he was harassed with her uh, blasphemous thoughts. Suddenly, a new light shone up in upon him, showing him of what kind of righteousness the gospel is speaking. He relates that from the moment he began to run through the Holy Scriptures in an endeavor to obtain a clear understanding as to what portions of Scriptures are law and what in which gospel. He says he pried into every book into the Bible, and now all parts become clear to him. The birth of the Reformer 
dates from the moment when Luther understood this distinction. The tremendous success of his public activity, moreover, is due to the same cause. By this new knowledge, Luther liberated the poor people from the misery into which they have been driven by the law preaching of their priests. You are to become pastors, my friends. Do you not sense that immense importance of this matter for your future vocation? Some, someone who is in anguish and distress will come to you. In every instance, the cause of such anguish of soul will be that of law has taken effect in your parishioner, and it does not occur, occur to him that he can be saved by the gospel. He does not think of that while he wails, Alas, I am a poor sinner, I am worthy of damnation, etc. To such a person you must say, You are indeed a lost and contemned creature, but the passage of Scripture which has told you that, told you that is law, there is, however, another teaching in Scripture. The law has done its work in you, but the law has come has done its work in you, but the law is to come the knowledge of sin. You must now quit Sinai and go to Golgotha. See yonder your Savior, blessing, bleeding and dying for you. Not until you enter the ministry will you realize the great importance of the distinction between the law and gospel and the fact that only the knowledge of this distinction and nothing else will make you capable to discharge the office that is to save the world. The matter of paramount importance, of course, will always be this, that you have experienced this distinction upon yourself. I am not referring to those among you who have never been in anguish over your sins, who consider themselves orthodox, because they have been reared in Christian homes. I am referring to those who are concerned about their salvation. There will be moments when such of you will imagine that you are God's children again. There will be times when you think that your sins have not been forgiven you. If on such occasions you desire genuine peace, it can come to you only through the knowledge of the distinction of law and gospel. In the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, uh, and he's quoting Mueller here, uh, which would be his Christian Dogmatics, page 119, uh, we read, For rightly to understand the benefit of Christ and the great treasure of the gospel, which, Christ, which Paul extols so greatly, we must separate as far as the heavens are from the earth. The promise of God and the grace that is offered on the one hand from the law and on the other. No, it doesn't sound right. We must separate as far as from the heavens or from the earth the prom promise of God and the grace that is offered on the one hand from the law on the other. The word of God may preach the gospel to us with such great comfort shall nevertheless not obtain the peace it offers unless we know that Holy Writ contains also the law from which we have escaped, and that being lost and doomed sinners, we have embraced the gospel. We may hit, a, hit upon a comforting passage and say to ourselves, Ah, I have the forgiveness of sins. And then we read, and then we may strike in other passages which makes us, that, makes us believe that we are lost. All this because we do not know the distinction between law and gospel. The formula of Concord and the epit epitome. Uh, Mueller, page uh, 533. We believe, teach, and confess that the, that the distinction between law and the gospel is to be maintained in the church with great diligence as an especially brilliant light, by which, according to the ad admonition of St. Paul, the word of God is rightly divided. This is repeated in the Declaration. Uh, 
of Article 5, Mueller, page uh, 633, as follows. As the distinction between the law and the gospel is a brilliant light which serves to the end that God's word may be rightly divided and the scriptures of holy prophets and apostles may be properly explained and understood. We must guard, guard it with a special care in order that these two doctrines may not be mingled with one another or a law be made out of the gospel. Get that now. Or a law, which a lot of do, a law be made out of the gospel whereby the merit of Christ is obscured in troubled conscience, conscience, consciousness, consciences um, half asleep are robbed of their comfort, which they otherwise have in the Holy Gospel, when it is preached genuinely in its purity, and by which they can support themselves in their most grievous trials against the terrors of the law. If these two doctrines are not kept separate, the merit of Christ is obscured. For when I, I am afraid of the threatening of the law, I have forgotten Christ, who says to me, Though your sins be as scarlet, they have been become, they shall be as white as snow. All ye that labor or are heavy laden do, do but come, and you shall find rest unto your souls. These facts will not be highly or rightly proclaimed by the preacher unless he has received the indiable impression of the distinction between law and the gospel. Only he, moreover, can lay down and die in peace. The devil may whisper all manner of insinuation. In, 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 oh, I'm half asleep, I shouldn't even be reading. In, insinuations to him. But he will say to, to him, Your charges against me are quite correct, but I have another doctrine which tells me altogether different. I am glad that the law has put me in such a woeful plight, for now I can relish in the gospel all the more. At the conclusion of Article 5, we read in the formula of, of Concord, Quote, now, in order that both doctrines, that the law and the gospel, be not commingled and co-founded with one another, and what belongs to the one may be ascribed to the other, whereby the merit and benefits of Christ are easily obscured, and the gospel is again turned into a doctrine of the law, as has occurred in the papacy. And thus Christians are deprived of the true comfort which they have in the gospel against the terrors of the law. And the door is again opened in the church of God to the papacy. Therefore, the true and proper distinction between law and gospel must with all diligence be inculculated and preserved. And whatever gives occasion for confidence between the law and the gospel, that is, whereby the two doctrines, law and gospel, may be confounded and mingled into one doctrine, should be diligently prevented. We, too, are in that great danger here sketched. Read the writings of those who claim to be the, to be the best preachers. They terrify, to be sure, but their incisiveness is due to the fact that they confound the law with the gospel. As a result, people who have read these writings are on their dying bed often harassed with doubts. Many... A one among them dies with the thoughts in his with the thoughts in his head all see whether God will receive me. Anyone dying in such uncertainty does not de depart in saving faith. Now whose fault is it, at least in many instances instances? The preachers. However well, however the preacher must be also be careful not to say that the law has been abolished, for this is not true. The law remains in force. It is not abrogated. But we have another message besides that of the law. God uh, does not say, By the law is righteousness, but by the law is the knowledge of sin. Yea, we read in the epistle to the Romans, To him that, to him that believeth on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Hence we are on the right way to salvation the moment we are convinced we are ungodly. 
commenting on Galatians 3.19, Luther says, If the gospel is not fundamentally and plainly set apart from the law, it is impossible to keep the Christian doctrine unadulterated. Again, when the distinction has been correctly and firmly established, established we can have a, fi a fine and correct knowledge of the manner. How and by what means we are to become righteous in the sight of God, where this is illuminating knowledge, illuminating knowledge prevails, it is easy to distinguish faith from works, Christ from Moses, the gospel from the law of Moses, and all other secular laws, statutes, and ordinances. In conclusion, Shemitz writes in his chapters on theology, uh, his local uh, theology, in the chapter on justification, Paul states distinctly that the righteousness which is valid in, in the sight of God is revealed in the gospel apart from the law. Hence, the principle, the, the principle matter and this iniquity regarding justification is that the true and proper distinction between the law and the gospel be fixed and carefully maintained. Is there for any other light? Is there any other light besides that one furnished by the true distinction between the law and the gospel that has so forcibly broken up the dense darkness of the Pope's dominion? The darkness of the papacy has not been dispelled by any other light than the appearance 